Yep. So yeah, that would put us exactly where I remember us being chapter 14, which is basically exactly in the middle of the book. Okay. Bonnie sat motionless in a relatively open spot under the tree canopy. With the sun setting, only a few beams of light penetrated the woody, uh, woody framework above. She scanned the darkening skies as they stood different at different elevations <clears throat> on the slope, looking like huge soldiers struggling to scale the mountain. Their hardened legs, skinny, hairy ones, smooth, muscular ones, all stretched skyward towards their invisible bodies. They drip dropped multicolored leaf leaflets, floating misshapen mis papers that spun and weaved their way to the ground, wasted and tromped upon by the advancing army. The leaflets whispered a message as they blew into one another and against the marching legs, making a musical rustle in the wind. With the Slayer nowhere in sight, Bonnie closed her eyes and listened to the theme. For a moment, she didn't care where she was, oblivious to the pain, awash in a daydream about flying above it all, about every care in the world. <clears throat> the blowing leaves sang a hypnotic song in mournful airies and tingling bells. Something snapped in the brush. She shook herself out of her trance, struggled to her feet, and limped towards a dense group of trees. Her knee buckled, but she ca but she flapped her weakened wings and stayed upright, though her stumbling, slit, sliding feet dragged, making an easy, easily followed path through the leaves. Rustling footsteps trailed her, growing louder and louder. As weak and winded as she was, she could never get away. Even if she made it to the trees, the slayer would still catch her. <clears throat> Hand clamped over her mouth, and she tumbled forwards. She tried to flail, but strong arms held her in check. Lying on her stomach, she kept backwards, but her foot struck only air. The hand lifted. Bonnie, settle down or the Slayer will find us. Billy? She spun her head in as far back as she could. It's you, thank God. When she pulled free and sat up, he whispered his voice hoarse in the cold wind. We have to hide. The Slayer's coming this way. He lifted her to her feet and pulled her arm around his back. When his hand gripped her, uh, gr with his hand gripping her shoulder, they trudged across the dim mountainside, wading and kicking through ankle-deep leaves. <clears throat> After scaling a rise, navigating a downslope, and crossing flat terrain over uneven rocks, they hid behind a huge stump in the uh, midst of a hedge of short evergreen, evergreen trees. The lush, dark foliage promised a much better hideout than anyone else, um, than anywhere else she had seen. But would it be dense enough to conceal them from the evil slayer's eyes? I saw that slayer down the slope, Billy said, pointing over the rise. So I followed him. Then I heard you. He heard you too, and started this way. But I got here before he did. He has that limp, you know. What? Billy, st uh, Bonnie stared, but Billy s shushed her. Let's wash and listen, he said in a soft whisper. Bonnie quieted herself, though she trembled and sobs tried to break through in halting spasms. Madman lurked only seconds away. Would he find them? And if he did find them, what would he do? Please, God, keep me calm. Hide us in the palm of your hand. Bonnie felt Billy's arm fall gently around her shoulders, and then a strong squeeze. The pressure to her wounds pierced like a hundred tiny knives, but the warm reassurance was worth it. Her spasms stopped, and the two waited quietly for the inevitable appearance of the Slayer. Soon, a ringing phone announced his arrival. Bonnie leaned forward, trying to hear the side, his side of the conversation. At first, she could only see him nodding with his phone to his ear, but as he drew closer, his gruff tones came through. Good. You found the sword. Yes. I'm on the trail of the girl. I'm sure I heard her. Yes. Keep to the schedule, but bring the papers and the badges, and a syringe and a vial. 
I'll be able to get some blood yet. Did you hear all that? The slayer halted and looked down at the leaves. He swiveled his head from side to side, apparently trying to follow a still down, uh, follow a trail. When he made up his mind, he walked slowly, his head still down, as he raised his feet to keep from rustling the leaves. Soon, his direction became clear. He was heading straight toward their hiding place. Still hiding in the closet, Mr. Uh, still hiding in the closet, Walter and Mr. Hamilton waited, listening. Since they had huddled in a kneeling position between a bookshelf and the back corner of the closet, the tight squeeze brought more di and more discomfort. Walter's knee cried out for a stretch, his thigh cramped. Why wouldn't the man in the trench coat just leave so that they could get out of there? The man spoke loudly into his cell phone, as though he had a weak connection. Think you can find the girl? If anyone can find her, it's you, Sir Devon. What dragon has ever escaped your grasp? Shall I pick up the others before I come to look for you on 33? Yes, I got it. Every word, sir, every word. He slid the phone back into his coat pocket, turned off the closet light, and doused the office light before closing the door behind him. After waiting a few seconds, Mr. Hamilton rose and grabbed Walter's arm. Come, we must hurry. The two sulked out of the office, guided by Mr. Hamilton's flashlight. Walter knew better than to ask questions now. Besides, his throat was too tight. He would probably squeak. As expected, danger brought a buzzing thrill, but it might also bring a painful end, sort of like jumping from the top of a building. The feeling of flying through the air was probably awesome, but the splat on the ground kept a guy from talking, taking the leap. When they reached the exit, Mr. Hamilton switched off the flashlight, cracked the door open, just enough to peek out. Walter whispered, Do you see anyone? Car's leaving the lot. I wonder if the driver noticed mine parked in the teacher's lot. Mr. Hamilton pushed the door open, fully open. I think it's safe. After emerging into the cold evening air, he turned to Walter. At least we know uh, to drive on the on Highway 33. When my, when my call comes in, we'll have a better idea of where to go. We have to find them before Whittier and this man do. Are you with me? Walter spread his hands. I don't get it. What was that stuff about dragons? And why do we have to get there before they do? Mr. Hamilton bent and spoke to Walter face to face. It's clear that Dr. Whittier has gone mad. He fancies himself to be the real Sir Devon. And he still thinks he's chasing dragons. Remember, he mentioned the girl. Do you know about the one whom he might be speaking? Walter throat tightened again. Bonnie? Mr. Hamilton slapped himself on the forehead. Of course. Why didn't I think of it? Whittier asked me about Miss Silver. He somehow thinks of her as a fair maiden whom he must rescue from the Bannister family. Because of Arthur's refusal to allow Devon to go on his insane dragon missions in the King's uh, missions, the King's descendants, the Bannisters symbolize the dragons for him. I know it sounds totally mad, but don't you see? Um, if you say so, Mr. Hamilton. Walter, reading, uh, read the earnestness in the aged man's face. Of course they had to go. He shrugged. Okay, I'll come with you, but uh, can I stop by my house first? Of course, of course. Mr. Hamilton step <coughs> stepped quickly towards the parking lot. Walter, Walter followed, nearly running to keep pace. We shall be in a great hurry, but I should like to see your father again. We will both explain the situation to your parents. I'm confident they'll still allow you to accompany me. Walter caught up and walked at his side, looking at him hopefully. But leave out the dragon part, okay? Mr. Hamilton stopped at his car and fumbled with his keys. Oh, very well, very well, as you wish, Walter. The slayer halted atop a small rise and scanned the mountainside. Bonnie tried to follow his gaze, looking at him every couple of seconds to see where he might go next. The dense patch of trees they hid within stretched out in a tapered 
in a tapered hedge for at least a hundred feet, followed by a narrow footpath along the mountain's face, as though the hedge were trying to wrap the mountain in a leafy garland. The slayer stared directly into their hiding place, his unearthly eyes seemingly piercing the dense growth. He squinted, keeping his gaze pinned on their refuge. Bonnie gulped. He was staring right at her. She again prayed silently, Dear God, please help us. The slayer turned to his side. A long stream of white vapor gave away his, his sigh of frustration. He looked at the ground and kicked a few leaves before turning and marching down slope. When he disappeared over a ridge, Billy turned to Bonnie and whispered, He's out of sight, but if we don't keep up, we'll never find our way to the road. I have a map I drew, but it won't do me any good when it gets dark. It'll be better if we follow him from a distance. Still throbbing all over, Bonnie grasped Billy's hand. After he helped her to her feet, she pulled away, keeping her voice low. Your hands are ice cold. Billy rubbed his hands together briskly. Yeah, it's hard to get. Uh, it's hard to blow on them while I'm running. And I gave you that. And I gave you your sweater. I lost it on the way down. That's right. That's all right. Billy reached for her. Come on. It's warmer if we keep moving. Bonnie took his hand again and tested her weight on her right foot. Pain stabbed her knee. She leaned over and massaged the aching joint. Can you walk at all? She looked at him while rubbing. Walk? Maybe. Run? No. No way. Fly? I doubt it. She flapped her wings. More pain knifed in. She grimaced and swallowed a yelp. I guess we'll have to do go without me. Billy shook his head. Not happening. I already left my injured mother behind. I'm not about to do the same to you. Your mother, Bonnie straightened, her cheeks warming. I forgot I should have asked about asked you what happened. Billy sighed. Yeah, the Slayer got us both spooked. Mom and I jumped <coughs> with a parachute and she hurt her ankle. Dad stayed in the plane and it crashed somewhere. Bonnie covered her mouth. Oh, Billy, I'm so sorry. Billy looked at the ground. I know it sounds weird, but Mom's sure he's still alive. Anyway, it can't be too much further to the highway. That's probably where the Slayer is going. We need to get help before the plane, for, uh, help to find the plane before he does. Bonnie pulled Billy's hand around her back, just under her wings. She wrapped her arm around his shoulders to prop herself up, keeping as much weight as possible off her sore knee. She looked into his eyes, determined to show courage. I'll do the best I can. For the next hour or so, the two worked their way down the slippery leaf-covered slopes, slowly and painfully. Bonnie forced back several more yelps, knowing Billy w would uh, slow down even more if she were to give him a hint of torture she was feeling. <coughs> Whenever she thought she, could, she couldn't go another inch, Billy pulled her forward once again giving her the courage she needed to go just a few more steps. His only words were spoken to motivate her, to give her strength. Come on, we can do it. Or, probably just one more rise. It'll be downhill the rest of the way. His face was like flint, as dripping sweat gave away how hard he was working. How could, how could he do it? Bonnie didn't want to wimp out on him, but she feared that any minute the pain would overcome her will to go on. Mr. Hamilton looked at Walter from the driver's seat. We just passed the uh, country road 10 on the left. How much further is it to Al Alpina? Walter pulled the road map close to his face. The spotlight from overhead the overhead pilot lamp gave too little light to make much difference. The flashlight batteries had died a while ago. The growing darkness covered the land. Out in the mountain wilderness, no street lights interrupted the black monotony. I think it's a couple of miles. It's too dark to be sure. Mr. Hamilton tried to glance at the map. 
They said they would have a cruiser at that intersection, so I assume there will be flashing lights to signal where it is. As the car accelerated. <clears throat> As the car accelerated, Walter clutched the armrest tightly. They had already been going fast on the curvy mountain road, but on this straightaway, they had uh, been doing <laughs> they had to be doing ninety. <laughs> Lives may be at stake, Mr. Hamilton mumbled mumbled. Mustn't worry about speeding ticket now. Within a couple of minutes, flashing blue lights appeared in the distance. Walter pointed. There, police lights. Indeed, it won't be long now. After stopping at the intersection and receiving instructions from the police officer, Mr. Hamilton left the main highway and drove north on the country road for 12, 12 for several miles, a dark narrow strip with hairpin turns, plunging dips and breathtaking rises. A trackless roller coaster through an ink black forest. Finally, he decelerated and made a sharp left onto a forest road, marked with a sign calling it number 162. Then, a few hundred feet up the road, he turned left into a parking area next to a foot trail that led into the wilderness. <coughs> And soon they parked next to a huge noisy generator. Walter and Mr. Hamilton got out, fastened their coats, and looked around for someone in charge. Several men worked on setting up a light standard, uh, setting up a light standard near the trailhead, and a couple of big lamps flooded the area with light. An assortment of spot, uh, sport utility vehicles and pickup trucks had lined the um, perpendicular to the road and one truck uh, bed held a big steel cage with two baying dogs scratching to get into the action. Walter followed Mr. Hamilton towards a uniformed man standing by a state patrol car about 50 feet away. <coughs> when the policeman finished a radio conversation, Mr. Hamilton gave him a friendly nod. Good evening. My name is Charles Hamilton. My young friend Walter Foley and I are here to join the volunteer search team. His father, Carl Foley, will also be joining us in the morning if the search is still underway. The patrolman looked in the direction of the tr uh, trucks behind him. Look for a red-haired guy with a full beard. That's Scott. He's organizing the next group out. Mr. Hamilton strode up. Uh, on with <coughs> Walter following again. As they walked, the breeze kicked up, a much cool, colder, more biting wind than back at Castlewood. When they found Scott, he welcomed them with, a hearty, with hearty handshakes. A thick red beard masked his square jaw, and a checkered flannel shirt covered his stocky arms, making him look like the stereotypical lumberjack. His deep voice, however, carried no trace of local accent as he spoke with the direction with the diction of a college professor. The low pressure area is riding northeast on the cold front, which means that we'll have to get out there before the precipitation begins. Air support is at a minimum, and locals are still arriving. He pointed across the road. One group, um Mun group go east across Glady Fork toward P Panther Camp Ridge and Sully. The other group will go west on the footpath towards Shavier, uh, Shavers Mountain. We'll have one chopper on each side with searchlights. I don't know how long they'll be able to stay airborne with all the crosswinds at mid-levels, so we have to get moving. Mr. Hamilton and Scott discussed their options while Walter looked out. Uh, <clears throat> over the barely visible mountain tops, as the cold wind attacked again, the worries of the night and the smell of diesel generator worked together to stir his stomach into an evil boiling swill, swill pot. He pulled his coat closer and pressed his hands tightly against his belly. Above, dark clouds shrouded the tallest peaks. A helicopter guided a beam of light through a, a driving wave of low mist. What hope did that overgrown flashlight have of finding anything in such a big place? Not much. But if anyone could <coughs> find his way out of those woods, Billy could. Walter listened in on the conversation. Scott mentioned the huge uh, number of square miles in the search area he called the Otter, um, Otter Creek Wilderness. 
The lump in Walter's throat swelled to the size of a goose egg. A wilderness? What dangers caused the locals to give it that name? He looked up again and tried to re <coughs> restrain emerging tears. God, he whispered, please help Billy get home. That was chapter 14. Now we are on to chapter 15. <coughs> Bonnie looked up from her seated position, rubbing her aching knee again. So sorry, Billy. That's all right. I need to rest too, but we'd better move to a safer place. He helped her rise and, <coughs> almost fully supporting her, headed across the leaf-filled channel to a large tree with smooth white bark. And they sat together at its base and leaned back against its massive trunk. Knowing they had to huddle to stay warm, Bonnie scrunched her wings and sat close to Billy. Billy massaged his arms. Really getting cold. My sweat's drying up and I'm getting numb. He blew on his uh, cracking hands and rubbed them together. I can't do this for long. My breath is shiv shriveling my skin. Guess we'd better keep moving so you'll stay warm. I'd give you my sweatshirt, but it's all I have. Billy stopped rubbing. No, I'm okay. We'll stay. You have to rest. He rose and began sweeping leaves together <coughs> toward the trunk with both feet. After a few minutes, he had pushed together, um... Let's see, I skipped something. He had pushed enough together to make a chest-high nest around Bonnie. He sat next to her again, gathering the leaves towards his own body, enough to cover himself to his elbows. Bonnie nestled into their leaf blanket. It helped, but goosebumps still covered Billy's lower, uh, bare lower arms. He had been so kind, so chivalrous, uh, um, obviously taught by a true dragon. The leaves are great, Billy, she said, bending on at the waist, but we're still cold at the top. Lean forward for a second. Uh, sure. When he had bent forward enough to make a gap between him and the tree. <coughs> Bonnie extended her wings fully. Now move closer to me. He slid next to her, hip to hip. I bet I'll, I stink by now. No worse than I do. Bonnie wrapped her wings around their bodies. Pull your arms in so I can close the gaps. <coughs> when Billy complied, Bonnie made a shell with her wings, leaving their heads only their heads exposed. With leaves covering their lower portions, the wind had no way to enter their makeshift shelter. Warmer? She asked. Definitely. Billy looked at the at their leather-like blanket. It's amazing how you can bend your wings all in all the right places to do that. I've had a lot of practice. Some nights I fly to the top of the mount hard and and look at the stars. The peak is usually above the low clouds, and it can get real cold up there. So I just make a cocoon and I'm fine. Since my wings don't get cold. It works out great. You look, you just look at the stars. Doesn't that get boring after a while? Bonnie sh <coughs> stared into the starless sky. Well, I pray quite a bit, and I think about things, you know? What I'd like to do, where I'd like to go. Billy turned towards her. Their eyes met within inches of each other. Only the slightest glow from the moon painted clouds above Bonnie to see Billy's face. It was tired, but warm. Sincerity poured forth. What would you like to do, Bonnie? He asked. Where do you want to go? Bonnie looked forward and sighed. What I'd really like... Her voice trailed off into a trembling whisper. I'd really like to have my mother back. She remained quiet for several seconds. Then she sniffed. The tortured, cracking voice, she continued... I know you'll try to understand. Maybe you'll understand now that your father's missing, but it's real hard to talk about. She stopped again. Take your time, Billy said softly. Bonnie nodded, thankfully, and went on, still in a choking voice. I watched my mother die. I didn't see how it happened, but when I got to her, she had a huge gash in her stomach. It was awful. She was barely alive, lying there on the living room floor. She told me to run, to 
get to the state agency as fast as I could. Just like we had planned. I knew what to do. But I didn't want to leave. I held her hand. <clears throat> I knew what I had to do, but I didn't want to leave. I held her hand for a few seconds, and then I heard a noise, like, ru like heavy footsteps. Mama's eyes got real big, and she said, Run! Don't look back! Just run! Then her eyes closed, and she stopped breathing. I didn't dare scream or cry. I just ran out the back door, all the way out into town. Did it go to the foster care? Yes. Bonnie sniffed again, and gathered herself before continuing. I knew who to ask for, and all the paperwork was already done. They had a new last name for me and a place to <coughs> go, and Mom had already arranged for me to get transferred to Castlewood, because she knew that that's where your father lived. <coughs> she even had a train ticket for me. The only problem was that she didn't tell me exactly where you'd live. I'm not sure if she knew that herself. She never told me your father's human name. I suppose she was going to contact him if things got too dangerous. Mom never finished her plans, but obviously she knew all this could happen. Because the Slayers were after her? Bonnie tightened her lips and nodded. And you've been looking for my dad ever since? She nodded again, her eyes clenched shut to keep in the tears. After a minute of... <clears throat> hey! <laughs> Hey, Kuro, what's going on? The after a minute or two of silence, Lily let out a sympathetic sigh. Though, I guess you really miss your mom. You want a new home? Some real parents? She nodded once more, her eyes still closed. She turned to him, felt the warmth of his breath caressing her cold nose. <laughs> hey, hey, yourself, Kuro. <laughs> But when she opened her eyes, darkness had enveloped him. She couldn't see him at all. That's the part I hope you never have to go through, she said. Can you imagine transferring from one home to another? Having a new set of brothers and sisters every couple weeks? Nobody wants me because I'm so weird. Her voice sputtered and cracked. Sometimes I wake up and I'm afraid to open my eyes. <coughs> I wait and... Till I can picture where I am, and sometimes I can't remember. Then, I hear strange voices in the hall. I don't even know where who they belong to. Yes, we are storytelling. It is Raising Dragons, Brian Davis. We are a little bit over halfway done. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is the first book of the series. I have the rest of the... Uh, what do you call it? The rest of what I've read so far um, on YouTube and also saved as uh, Twitch clips. So, yeah, you can always catch up to where we are with those. Let's see, her voice grew louder and sobs punctuated her words. Sometimes I'm not even alone in bed. Can you imagine trying to keep my secret when I have to sleep with a little sister? Can you imagine trying to explain to my new parents? Why I can't go to the doctor? And why I always wear a backpack? Why I never let them hug me? Her voice squeaked, forcing her to stop for a moment. After taking a deep breath, she continued, through um, those sobs again interrupted. And sometimes, when I think of my mother, how she would hug me, Bonnie broke down, unable to keep her head from bobbing as she wept. I'm sorry. I just miss her so much. Billy slid both arms under, around her. They leaned their heads together as he hugged her close and rocked her gently. Forever and ever, Bonnie. I will always be your friend. The two stayed quiet for several minutes. Bonnie's crying subsided, and the tears on her cheeks began drying. Soon, a new wet sensation soaked through her hair. Is it raining? Billy shook his head clinging droplets. No, it's snow. At least we'll have clean water to drink. Those mountain streams are nice and cold, <clears throat> but that last one was pretty muddy. 
Bonnie lowered her head toward her chest. Do this with me. When bon Billy complied, part of Bonnie's wings shifted over their heads. He whispered, Amazing. Now, if you can stand the smell, try to get some rest. I guess there's no use trying to find the road in the dark. Bonnie yawned. Nope, not a chance. My mom's probably huddled under a big pile of leaves or something. Yep, she's a smart one. Bonnie yawned again. In a few seconds, she drifted off to sleep. Hmm. As dawn broke, a group of weary searchers stepped out of a Ford expedition and into a field of white powder. Walter, through bleary, um, through bleary eyes, couldn't help but enjoy this, the sight. How much snow do you think we got, Mr. Hamilton? Mr. Hamilton kicked the snow with his boot. He looked a lot different, with his wild gray hair stuffed under a royal blue ski cap. Only a few wispy locks poked out near his earlobes. Oh, I would estimate about 15 centimeters. Centimeters? I guess that's about, uh, about six inches, Walter. Mr. Hamilton pat patted him on the back. I'm sure you're tired. We had only three hours of sleep in that seedy uh, motel, but we must get to work. Walter gazed at the awakening skyline. Yeah, Billy's still out there somewhere. Mr. Hamilton tilted his head. I hear the helicopter. Perhaps daylight brings us good news. As they headed for the search team's m morning rendezvous, the chopper buzzed over the ridge, drawing closer. News, whether good or bad, would arrive soon. <coughs> Following the directions of their group leader, Walter and Mr. Hamilton joined a uh, sweep line each person staying within sight distance of the next as they walked up a mountain. When they moved well into the trees, they maintained contact through various calls and shouts, sh slowing their progress as they scaled the slope. Their group leader carried a walkie-talkie and barked updates that had been delayed from the helicopter after an hour or so. He let out a whoop. They found the plane! They found the plane! Everyone in the party followed the sound of the shouting and gathered to listen to the news. It's on Shares Mountain, south of us, Leader said from atop a stump. Let's head back to the base and extract coordinates. I'm sure we'll be con uh, concentrating the search in that area. With renewed enthusiasm, the search team hurried down the mountainside and into the valley. When they arrived at the base camp, Walter and Mr. Hamilton found the police officer they had met the night before. <clears throat> he was engaged in a heated debate with another man, apparently the leader of a trio that waited nearby. Look, I don't know who you are, the patrolman said. What makes you, can thi you think you can come down here and take over something you know nothing about? The other man flashed his badge in a leather case. I'm not taking over. I'm just telling you to report all findings to me. If you don't, I will take over. The patrolman left in a huff, and the man with the badge he looked over at his three friends and left. Bunch of local yokels. Come on, let's get the, to the crash scene. Walter tried, uh, tugged his teacher's coat and whispered, Mr. Hamilton, look at that guy. Is that who I think it is? Mr. Hamilton pulled Walter aside. Don't show your face. Yes. He does look like Whittier, or whatever he's calling himself and he's walking with a limp. He lowered his voice to a whisper. I suggest that we call him Devon, at least for now, to prevent confusion. Let's talk to the patrolman and see what's going on. The two <coughs> high stepped through the snow covered grass to the patrolman's car. The officer sat behind the steering wheel, talking on the radio. Yes, yeah, Special Agent Albert Devon. He says he's FBI. The officer looked at Walter and Mr. Hamilton. Yes? Mr. Hamilton cleared his throat. We know who the agent is. He's not who he claims to be. The patrolman squinted, casting a doubtful expression. Who is he then? Mr. Hamilton lifted his brow with, with a knowing sort of air. Have you heard the name Whittier in your investigation? Of course. The missing principal. The guy who tried to kill the girl back in Castlewood. 
Walter tugged on Mr. Hum uh, Hamilton's coat again. He waved Walter off. Just a moment, Mr. Foley. He refocused on the officer. Albert Devon is Dr. Whittier. The patrolman's eyes widened. What? Are you sure? Positive. The officer got out of his car and looked at the supposed FBI agent. And he's the one who tried to kill the mystery girl? Mr. Hamilton crossed his arms and nodded. They are very same. Oh, the very same. The squad car radio crackled back to life. The patrolman leaned in and listened on the static-filled transmission, too quiet to decipher from where Walter stood. When the patrolman straightened, his brow bent towards his nose. Devin checks out. I'm supposed to do whatever he says. Mr. Hamilton blinked. What? Impossible. Mr. Hamilton? The teacher um, turned sharply to Walter. Yes, Mr. Foley, what is it? The plane. Were there survivors? Mr. Hamilton blinked at Walter, then slapped himself on the forehead. Of course, too many distractions. He turned back towards the patrol car. Officer, what of the crash site? What was found? The officer slammed the car door shut and gazed towards the hills. Good news and bad news, I suppose. The good news is that the plane didn't explode, and there were no bodies around anywhere. He looked again at Mr. Hamilton. The bad news is that they found a lot of blood and signs of something being dragged away. There are bears in the area, you know. Walter gulped. Bears? And the snow's making the search for footprints difficult. Aviation is, um, is consulting by phone, and they said that the plane could have had parachutes. Maybe the passengers jumped. You mentioned the mystery girl, Mr. Hamilton said. Her name is Bonnie Silver. We have reason to believe she was on the plane. I'll call that in and see what the what missing person says. The officer <coughs> opened the car door again, slid into the seat, and looked at Mr. Hamilton. Are you sure that Agent Devon couldn't be FBI? Actually, I'm not sure what to think anymore, Mr. Hamilton pointed <coughs> discreetly at Agent Devon. But that man is the Castlewood Middle School principal who calls himself Whittier. There's no doubt about that. I'm a teacher there, and I know him personally. The patrolman grabbed the radio. I'll try to get a photo faxed over here. If he's really Whittier, we'll find a way to keep him off that mountain. Walter stepped towards the officer. If they jumped, any idea where? They're mapping the possibilities now. Get back with your search unit and you'll find out. A step closer. I know Bonnie was on the plane. It'll help if everyone call uh, if everyone's calling out her name. The patrolman nodded. Good idea. I'll pass the word along. <clears throat> Walter and Mr. Hamil Hamilton reunited with their team. The number of people grew as the morning progressed likely because the locals had already heard about the finding of the plane. And now with news reporters and their TV cameras showing up, the whole world would soon know about it. <coughs> the search leader spread a map over a car hood and began explaining the colors uh, highlighting the various regions. The red area is the most likely jump zone, he said, pointing at the map. We'll start there and work our way to the orange zone, then to the yellow. Walter turned out the rest of the ex uh, Walter turned out no oh, tuned out the rest of the explanation and tried to move closer to Devon, keeping his head turned so he wouldn't be identified. He listened in on the principal's conversation with his crone, cronies. His usual gruff voice was unmistakable. With the teams close to the crash site, if you find Klausphere, radio me. I have a good idea where <coughs> that witch is, so I'm going after her myself. Mound shouted, They found someone on the mountain! Cheers erupted all around, drowning out the announcer's voice. Walter stood on tiptoes. A big man raised <coughs> his hands to quiet the swelling crowd, his panting breaths um, blowing clouds into the breeze. A woman, he said, still panting. The chopper sp spotted a woman near the top of the bridge. <coughs> they were able to pick her up a few minutes later. She's fine. Very cold. But she'll be fine. Who is it? Several people um, called. 
Microphones pushed through the tight throng to catch the rescuer's answers. The pilot's wife, and man, what a story she told. Anyway, a boy and girl are still out there somewhere. The pilot went down with the plane. The boy's uh, trying to find his way back, and the maniac, um, some maniac named Whittier has the girl. Uh, parachuted out of the plane with her in his arms. Whittier ca <clears throat> caused the crash and wants to kill the girl. Walter looked for the patrolman, but he was no longer at his car. Then he looked for Devon, but he was gone too. The woman refused medical help, the messenger continued. They're talking, uh, taking her to the crash site to join the search parties. Walter bit his lip. There was no time to lose. Whittier ha was sure to search for Bonnie and try to kill her. He couldn't wait for the police officer or anyone else. After searching for another moment, he spotted Devon, slowly easing away in a black pickup. He sprinted towards the truck just as it turned out of the parking lot area and onto the field. He leaped into the payload bed, hoping Devon would ignore the bounce and thinking it was just one of the many rough bumps in the parking area. Walter slid out uh, to the front of the bed and <clears throat> into a corner out of the rear view mirror's line of sight. So far, so good. He's still driving. Walter rode out the bumps, struggling to maintain a hold on the metal frame. The truck, probably four-wheel drive, pulled through the snow without much trouble. Devon ran it like a tank, ignoring runoff ditches and any other obstacle. It was full speed ahead, it seemed, and Walter felt every painful bounce. After a few minutes, the truck started climbing. When it began slipping in the snow, the engine shut off. Walter curled in the corner <coughs> and listened. The door opened and closed. When all fell quiet, he raised his head and searched for Devon. About a hundred yards away, Devon trudged up the side of the mountain on a narrow, snow-covered foot trail. Walter scrambled out of the truck and followed. Devon had a good lead, but that wasn't a problem. Walter followed, uh, could follow the footprints from well behind and avoid alerting Devon to his presence. Walter dashed from tree to tree, hiding himself and, and watching for a few seconds until Devon moved out of view behind a rock or over a rise. After stopping behind a massive oak in a dense part of the forest, Walter waited several seconds, then peeked out and scanned the area. Devon was nowhere in sight. Rushing ahead, Walter searched the snow for the principal's trail. At least eight lines of footprints marred the path, leading in every direction. None looked any fresher than the others. Walter kicked the snow. Glittering specks scattered and rained all around. There was no time to wait for a clue about which way to go. He had to guess.